Hi all, this is lecture 9.1, Gender Responsive Practices. Uh, in this lecture, we will be talking about how uh, gender interplays with the uh, criminal justice system, particularly the prison system. So uh, this uh, chapter uh, interplays with chapter four in your 14 in your text. Uh, first, we'll talk about uh, some basic definitions. Uh, we'll talk about how the uh, criminal justice system came to be the way it is uh, with women in it. Uh, then we'll talk more about women in prisons and then things that have been done to try to fix the problem. So uh, first we have to give some basic definitions. Um, first we have to address what exactly sex and gender is, just as a reminder in case you don't remember from SOCH 101. Uh, sex is your biological condition. It is your genitals and your DNA. Uh, so it's that component of uh, who you are while gender is how you express yourself in a gender way. So gender is how you act either male or female or um, something else in those similar regards. Uh, most people's sex matches their gender, but not everybody's does. Uh, so for transgender people, gender fluid people, gender non-conforming people, those people's uh, genders sometimes don't match their sex. Uh, but for the majority of us, uh, our sex does tend to match our gender. Sexual orientation then is, uh, to put very simply, who you want to have sex with. Uh, the majority of people are heterosexual, um, numerically, but some people are homosexual, some people are bisexual, pansexual, uh, asexual, and there are other sexualities as well. Uh, there is also some uh, sufficient evidence to show that sexual orientation may change over a life course. So just because you are attracted to the opposite sex today does not mean that you will still be attracted to the opposite sex. Uh, you may be attracted to the same sex or vice versa um, 30 years from now, for example. So with sex and gender and sexuality and all that, traditionally we have thought that all of this matches up all the time. We used to think that all men act masculine all the time, all women act feminine all the time, and then we thought everyone was cisgender and men only had sex with women and vice versa. That, that's the traditional way of viewing uh, gender and sexuality, right? A pretty rigid kind of system. Uh, however, the modern LGBT rights movement has shown us otherwise and a society is changing in response. We are becoming more permissive of people outside of uh, standard uh, genders, sexualities, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this content relating to gender is important to take into consideration when considering the position of women in prison, uh, namely because uh, there are some really heavily heavy gender assumptions made in the prison system uh, because people who are imprisoned are not allowed to speak up for themselves, right? So when they are uh, being misgendered, when they are being treated in ways that are not appropriate, um, effectively no one really cares. So let's look a little more detail at the role of women in prisons. Um, sorry about that. That's an extra slide. So let's look at the historic roots of male incarceration and female incarceration and that they are indeed different. Uh, the roots of male incarceration are that effectively, and our society still does this, that men are set up to be more violent than women. We expect men to commit more violent crimes and men often do commit more violent crimes. Well, why does this happen? Um, our society glorifies aggressive behavior in men. Uh, we go see action movies and I enjoy action movies, but basically all they are is 90 minutes of men killing and maiming typically other men, right? That's what an action movie is. That's what a superhero movie is. It's usually men attacking other men or women attacking people, but we tend to glorify this more in men. Um, so fighting, uh, gunplay, 
aggressive posturing, this is all seen as things that cool, confident men do. Uh, you could go back to uh, your Soch 101 book, uh, look up those concepts of toxic masculinity, uh, ideas that we associate with maleness that actually cause us to do some pretty ugly and heinous things and things that are actually criminal. Um, that's not saying that all ways of being masculine are toxic masculinity, but many of the ways that we have learned to be masculine, myself included, in society, um, aren't really good for us. We are more permissive of violent and or aggressive behavior when it is displayed by boys. Uh, parents, adults often say when two boys are being nasty or violent or aggressive toward each other, well, well, you know boys, you know, boys will be boys, right? That is, um, that could be, is at least for some males, the setup for aggressive behavior for the rest of their lives, and that kind of aggressive behavior uh, could effectively lead to prison one day. Uh, and this all should be noted because uh, prison was specifically designed to deal with violent men, right? Um, and the majority of men, of, of people in prison are male. Uh, so uh, the system by that, that standard uh, is still remaining, um, you know, set up for men. Now, the historic roots for female incarceration are different. Uh, it's, it's important to keep in mind that the prison system as we know it, and I mentioned this before, uh, came to be uh, toward the end of the American Civil War, so about the 1870s. And during this time, men were expected to be the aggressive ones, were expected to be the violent ones. Women were set up to be submissive and domestic. So during this era, a good woman would listen to what men did, and a good woman took care of the home. Fallen women then, or bad women, were rebellious, i.e. they didn't listen to men, and they were somehow interested in things outside the home, which is not something that women were really allowed to do. When women rebelled from the, the good woman model, uh, they were punished, just like men were punished by being put in prison. Women in this world were punished by being taken care of in private, even either in the family or the church. That certainly could in include uh, sanctioned domestic abuse. That could include uh, locking a woman up for a while, right, in almost like a private prison kind of situation. Um, and they, women were, uh, when it could not be taken care of in private, uh, put in asylums or finishing schools, uh, which were larger institutions, but they were not the prison systems that men were being put in. And women weren't put into prison for, for quite some time. Now, as society changed, those male-like punishments, those original prisons, were eventually applied to women because the old standards were obviously outdated. And they're, they're, they're very outdated for today's standards, and they, they were outdated certainly by the 1940s. Um, but much of this application of a male punishment, male-oriented system being applied to women are obviously flawed. And we're gonna go over some of the more overwhelmingly obviously flawed ways here in a second. So the needs of women are ignored by the prison system as it exists because men are the default per person in a prison system. This uh, it clearly has women as a textbook invisible population. What's an invisible population? A group that is ignored due to the assumption of an industry or a social institution. A real good example of this is uh, in the 1990s when our society still was trying to come to grips with the nature of being a diverse society. Uh, people, typically white people, very frequently said, well, well, I don't see color. They would say that when they saw a racist issue, right? Well, well I don't see race. Um, as we have Stephen Colbert saying, I just pretend everyone whites and it's all, everyone's white and it's all good. They wouldn't say the second spot, right? Because that's obviously the humor. 
Um, but it was very common during that era and previously to say, well, well, no, this isn't racism. Well, that kind of mindset ignores ignores um, the issue in the name of pretending to be equal, in the name of faux equality, right, a fake equality. So by treating women as so-called equal to men, not really equal, the prison system ignores the specific needs of women. Uh, this approach of ignoring that women and men are different is called the gender neutral classification. And it treats men and women in exactly the same ways in the names, name of equality. Uh, that's a pretty simple way to do it. It's also no way to actually achieve equality. So how do we fix this problem of uh, so-called gender neutrality? Well, we need to look at the differences between male and female prisoners. Uh, namely, the vast majority of prisoners are men. So the prison system as it's set up is by default, you know, set up for what a masculine prisoner would need, right? Uh, male prisoners tend to be more physically violent they have different biological needs, and uh, most men have different relationships with loved ones than women do, right? Uh, and we can, you know, we can talk all about that in like a gender unit in a social 101 class. We don't have quite time to talk about that here. Women on a very, very, um, very superficial sense have different biological needs right women use bras women have bras women have breasts women uh many women most women use tampons and other sanitary products because they have periods um a major issue in the prison system is that tampons and other sanitary products are are treated in the prison system as a luxury item they are not uh given out freely to prisoners uh to treat um, sanitary products as luxury items creates massively bad uh, hygiene issues in uh, the prison system, especially among populations who are at higher risk of bloodborne illnesses such as HIV and hepatitis. So people who use needle drugs, right? People who have addiction issues, people who may have contracted bloodborne illnesses on the outside or even on the inside, um, they there their are bloods everywhere and that's really gross and it is also intensely dangerous and so so just the example of treating tampons as a luxury item in the prison system is just like a key example of how you can't treat men and women as exactly equal and think that that means equality an alternate to this gender neutral classification that we talked about, that is called gender responsive practice. So uh, that definition being practices that are adapted to treat women differently from men. So, uh, so these practices are designed to be fair, not luxurious. Uh, that is a major issue within the prison system whenever a, a inmate or a classification of inmate is treated differently than another inmate that is often miscategorized as being some kind of undeserved luxury. Uh, the reality of the matter is that different human beings have different needs. And even if we do choose as a society to punish people using prison, we need to keep in mind that people are individuals, regardless of what the system believes or not. Uh, the best way to achieve good gender responsive practice is to apply uh, Bloom's gender responsive guidelines. And these are in your textbook, by the way, if you want to go over them in more detail. So many of Bloom's gender responsive guidelines uh, could also be applied to men's prisons as well. Uh, there's no reason that these couldn't also be applied to male prisons. And if they were, that actually would go a long way to um, making prisons uh, much more humane, not necessarily easier as many people don't want them to be, but making them more humane. Uh, and these guidelines are based on uh, some of the major premises of intersectional feminism. That premise being that each of our identities interacts to make us who we are and how we behave. 
So in, in intersectional feminist terms, uh, the way a woman, or for that matter, a man, expresses her gender is highly dependent on her other identities. So a white woman and a black woman may have very different feelings on what it means to be a woman, right? So uh, the way a black woman expresses herself, dresses, uh, acts in society is, is different than how a typical white woman is. And then if you add layer onto that, another identity, the black lesbian woman has a different way of being a woman than uh, a black heterosexual woman, right? And then you add on to that maybe a Latino woman, a Latino man, a gay Latino man, right? They're all very different people that express gender in very different ways. And uh, Bloom's gender responsive guidelines, uh, if we can incorporate these guidelines and how we treat women in prisons, uh, could lead to a more fair system. So uh, here we have three uh, qualities of Bloom's guidelines, three here, uh, four here. So let's go over each of these. Gender. Uh, you have to acknowledge that gender makes a difference. And that would be the intersection of being a convict in prison and gender, right? Acknowledging that a man in prison is different than a woman in prison. We look at environment. Uh, we create an environment based on safety, respect, and dignity. And that could be pretty neutrally applied to male and female prisons. And unfortunately, safety, respect, and dignity are not often built into the prison. We look at relationships relating to women. So we develop policies, practices, and programs that are re relational and promote healthy connections to children, family, significant others, and community. This has multiple layers to it. Uh, first of all, uh, it is shown that women who are in prisons do tend to have stronger relationships on the outside than men who are in prisons, um, namely because a lot of it has to do with patriarchy. Men are not encouraged to be in touch with their feelings in our society so and have good relationships. So therefore, men who go into prisons often don't have as good relationships going in. So unfortunately, they don't have as much need to maintain those relationships. Uh, when people get out of prison, both men and women, if they do have healthy connections to children and family and significant others, their recidivism rate is lower, right? So their um, actual uh, recommitment level is dramatically lower. And that's that's really important. We, we don't want our prisoners to go out and come back in and go out and come back in. I think that's a universal political statement is that we, we don't want that. <laughs> We don't want that to happen in our society. So to talk about this in terms of intersections, that is the intersection, family identity and being a prisoner. Services and supervision. Uh, we should address uh, substance abuse, trauma and mental health issues through comprehensive, integrated and culturally relevant services and appropriate supervision. Uh, this is an area, especially in for-profit prisons in the United States, that is almost always the first thing to be cut. Uh, significant therapy, uh, significant uh, substance abuse programs, they are very frequently cut in our prison system. And if they weren't, if they were better, better funded, uh, again, once people get out of prison, they might actually be better people. Uh, socioeconomic status. So we provide women with opportunities to improve their socioeconomic conditions. This is the intersection of class and being an inmate, right, of socioeconomic class. Uh, if you're a poor woman, uh, you stand a substantially uh, better chance of winding up in prison than a rich woman does. Um, same thing with men. Community. Uh, to establish a system of community supervision and re-entry with comprehensive collaborative services. This uh, comes into play uh, again with family as well, right? Family is part of your community, but there is more to community than that. And if we can plug people into their communities after they are released from prison, then they will be less likely to go back. And all of this finally has to be based on research-based practices. We can't just put together practices and policies based on, well, that sounds nice, that sounds good. We have to have actual evidence behind it. 
uh, that is the difference uh, in so many places uh, between uh, just doing something because it sounds good and doing something because it actually works. Now, there are some other tools for helping female inmates. Uh, we can use gender informed practice assessments. This is a tool in which we determine the degree to which women's prisons and correctional systems adhere to gender responsive principles and evidence based practices for women offenders. So this is effectively a, uh, a checklist and a assessment to see if uh, Bloom's uh, gender uh, taxonomy is actually being applied properly. And we can also use a women offender case management model that emphasizes an enriched case management approach to address the risk, needs, and responsive issues that are critical for success with women. So what is that jumble of words means? Um, it is more detailed, more compassionate, uh, more uh, substantive uh, case management right, that actually takes into account women's needs, as opposed to a case management model that is based off of a generic uh, prisoner. And that generic prisoner is uh, almost by definition, uh, due to the majority of male prisoners, male. Um, yeah, so these are just, this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Your book goes into an amazing detail on this topic. If you have greater questions on how women should or should not be treated in prison. Uh, check it out in the book or ask me specific questions. That'd be great. And um, I look forward to interacting with you soon.